Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Framing the Hammer, the podcast where we discuss all aspects of the creative industry, what is art, what art can be, what it can do for society, how it can change all of our lives. I am Gavin Lodge, your host and the executive director of 4A Arts, and I am honored and thrilled to be joined by my new friend Ishkoten, who is an artist I met at the uh, Santa Fe Indian Art Market. Uh, Ishkoten, welcome. Thank you for joining us. How's it going? Thanks for um, giving me this opportunity. Tell me, what is your medium and what inspires uh, your work when you are in the studio or um, wherever you may work? Well, um, I have very different or lots of tangents of medium or um, use with um, maybe stone um, or painting, works on different surfaces to create imagery. so it really depends on what is available as a as a medium. Um, I've even done different types of fashion. I guess if you would consider silk screen on apparel as fashion, I had a I had a dream of a famous artist one time. Um, his name was Fritz Shoulder, Native American artist. I think he was a professor at a school I went to in Santa Fe for art and um, he was eating a, a bucket of chicken and he was telling me how, how disappointed he was with um, Native artists and how um, everybody was worried about a certain, I guess, ego or price, I guess. And he was upset saying that, well, Na- Native art has become fast food and um, I, I thought that was kind of wild. And when I looked at the bucket of chicken, there's like this famous portrait that he did of himself, self-portrait. And his he was the colonel on, on the bucket. So I woke up and, and I did that. Um, I instantly did the um, design for a T-shirt. And it, it was pretty wild, though, to ha- have that kind of thought so w- when i woke up that next morning i, I thought well i'll just um p- push push out the art instead of trying to worry about trying to get the price i want mm-hmm. kind of like um for- forcing for force marketing and yeah. it- it's interesting though because it goes through all these different aspects of, of what the work can achieve so it it all comes down to the medium of um what what I have to choose from you know either stone or um two dimensional objects. Can you remind us also or tell us uh, where did you grow up and as a child what do you remember as being a formative inspiration for you to go on to be an artist? Well, I I, I grew up on. Um, in America <laughs> and on different tribal, tribal lands that are set aside for Native Americans called reservations um, right. from treaties that they made with the government. At, at one time, there was Native Americans couldn't leave the reservation. Um, they had to be either forced and taken to boarding schools or... Um, adopted or or sold sold out by different corrupt organizations in the 1930s so it really depends on i mean how i can answer that question of where i grew up at because it has a history that no one's really taught or it's kind of like a shun subject or avoidance i always say it's i don't know it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting question you know um because I grew, I'm two different tribal backgrounds. I'm, I'm Navajo and Apache, and in that sense, the, those words are basically slang words. They're not really the real tribal what they call themselves. Um, so uh, I think stuff like that is what created the Native art market at, at first contact. Um, there was a lot of marketing that happened at first contact with about 
people being able to bring native artifacts or native made stuff, you know, like the regalia, um, and and sell it to prominent people of the Western thought world of, you know, you're thinking about how the native art market at one time was about whatever they could bring from a pillaged village or whatever, you know, so... Mm -hmm. So you had to think think about um, at that time that native art market that started with with the prominent people of society like the royals, they would buy those items, and it was worth its weight in gold. So um, a lot of wealth started, I guess, right after the Dark Ages or or whatever the Renaissance things happening, you know. Um, it's it's real interesting because if you think about the aspect of where I grew up at, it comes with that whole history. You know, it doesn't just um, come with a choice of well, I'm gonna I'm gonna create art. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when when I grew up, it was mostly like I had these artifacts or tools that were abundant around the desert that was in northern Arizona by a place called Lake Powell. It's a um, Seven Wonders of the World, this one place called Rainbow Bridge. And it's a natural land bridge. And I guess in in, in the National um, Park Service, they talk about um, Navajo Mountain on the border of Utah and um, Arizona. They say that's one of the first mountains that came out when um, the, the water was covered to earth. So it's an old, old um, place for, well, it's the beginning of the Grand Canyon. So um, it's kind of interesting to be from that area. So when, when I grew up, I, I would have these like arrowheads that were made from prehistoric times. So that was kind of like the first arts or first art that I saw that a human could make and that it would tran transcend through that beginning of where where it was made at to where I'm at now, like a time um, vortex or some kind of message system, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so that's kind of what what kind of influenced my youth was understanding that um, there was a separation in society towards why I was in that area of growing up at. And and then I also lived in different cities too um, when when I was younger, but mostly settled down in Santa Fe. It's interesting to me to hear you talk about connection to the artifacts that surrounded you that inspired a sort of expression that has transcended eras and centuries. And, you know, I wanted to return to your acknowledgement that where you have grown up, where you did grow up, depends on your perspective, depends upon your, I don't know, um, awareness. I should have started off here, the podcast, acknowledging that I am uh, zooming in or, well, you know, connecting with you from the unceded lands of the Nahantic tribe, now in an area known as Lyme, Connecticut. And that um, there is layers and there are layers and layers of um, understanding that we, I as a white man, a non-native white man, um, am uh, reckoning with um, and learning about and, um, and realize that there are so many layers of um, history and culture that um, Native people are uh, hopefully being acknowledged and learned about, and uh, hopefully we're making some strides forward, whatever forward may mean, for uh, realizing that the history is really, really um, fraught with an awful lot of trauma and violence. Coming with that trauma and violence, actually, it seems to me that you might be implying some of your creativity comes out of um, a need to create something for the future and connected to the past, or 
Is it just wanting to express your inner thoughts that drives you? Or is it using the tools around you in, say, creative ways? Why do you create what you do? The whole idea of being able to feed my studio with with, with the art, you know, um, the studio doesn't exist without the the work being produced, you know. So I, I always, I felt um, since college or um, we call it, it, it was an institute of art that I went to. And um, I acknowledge at that time that if, if the artwork was going to succeed or the artist was going to succeed, then the studio would have to be, be a safe place for the artist to create. When I, when I was back in my training days as an artist or um, learning the avenues of um, the epicenter of art and the creative process and, and the energy that um, you capture with the movement of creativity or marking the surface or scratching the stone, there's a high end of minds that study this kind of stuff, you know, anthropologists or... Um, I forgot the name of, of the science um, academy that controls modern people's thoughts and what um, they're they're trained to to accept as as um, reality or or art in general. I think of the arts made for those kind of people in the future who are studying the the work um, under microscopes or whatever you know. There's also the aspect that maybe if the work is um, prominent a thousand years to 500 years from now, that it could possibly be worth its weight in gold. <laughs> you know, yeah. kind of like the vortex of the beginning of, of what I was talking about, about, about first contact and stuff like that, because the artwork is always made to fill that void um, that started, you know, because at, at first contact, when, when I say that, it's like 1491, you know, but they say that the Chinese came to um, America 10,000 years before um, Columbus was discovered here. The reason why I keep on bringing that up is because that's what really, really happened was um, it created this whole market. And I guess some Malaysian islands or some kind of islands over in Asia caught wind of um, there's a new market. So a lot of fake Native American art started, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it, it um, created this whole underground black market thing since, since you know, for, that's like 400 years of, of um, imitation Native art going to Europe because of that idea of... Um, it being it's worth its weight in gold. So there's like this weird inside fluctuation of native art where it was like worth the best and all the great families and minds, they, they had to have a piece of uh, the new world because the new world changed everything because religion was all based on, on Europe and how they were controlling society through the art and through religion there. And when they found a new world, it, it showed that they were being lied to. And it created a whole new market made of art market. So that's, that's why I always go back to that because it, it also can do the same thing in the future where they, they started doing this... Um, artificial intelligence where they're, if you've seen the headlines lately, they talk about it creating art that people can say that they can't tell the difference if it's made by an artist or a computer. Right. So th theoretically in the future, there won't be no artists or it will be against the law to have free thought to control, um, or not to control, but to be able to um, express yourself as a human being. And in artwork or in art in general, that's the documentation by scratching the stone or 
marking the surface to document creative freedom or the freedom of a human soul. So that whole part of um, that becoming a product and also being able to maybe get some monetary achievement through the process of art that it actually is um, feeds the studio and perpetuates the creative process over. So it's, it's really complicated if you don't want to just color code it <laughs> and, and come out with a simple answer and just say, well, you know, but it's, it's all connected there. And that's why the work that I do is more um, based on manipulating the surface instead of um see like like these these images are what society tells the human psyche that the brain accepts it as as a um native image because of the war paint maybe uh, so there's all these different archetypes that the human has been taught for yeah. over 400 years that um it pigeonholes native art you know, so mm -hmm. the stereotypes are what I think need to change in order for people to evolve society, basically, to know that Native, Native imagery is any image that a Native American makes, you know, of Indigenous culture. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's what's kind of, kind of wild when I think about what native um versus non-native because the non-natives are doing a lot of native american imagery but it's because there's that stereotype that the 400 years has taught people which is native image and that's kind of um keeping even the collector pigeonholed to think that way so that's where my work kind of comes in as a um, message to the future to hopefully some of the um, images go because of the collector into the future because of how important they, they, the art becomes to that individual, you know. Are you trying to bring joy to people or are you trying to change their minds and educate them? I mean, there's a certain element of protest, I feel like, in the way you talk about art. And um, is it, are you always trying to make a statement with it or are you just painting or creating what you see? Is there a point to what you're trying to do or besides breaking archetypes or, um, yeah, let me leave it at that. Well, the point is to um, being able to celebrate my existence, you know, because it, it all goes back to policy of Native America. And my, my, my family has a history that was being pursued by Kit Carson. Um, wow. Kit Carson was, is a um, famous person who, who worked for the government. Person and, was a diplomatic um, way of saying it. I have a feeling <laughs> he was a yeah, he was and, a, <laughs> a controversial and he, uh, figure in history for sure. Yeah, and he chased my family. Um, my my great grandfather had three wives and thirty three kids, and his his own brother or my other great grandfather had three wives and twenty seven children. So I, I don't know that comes out to almost sixty people or something like that that Kit Carson was chasing to um, where I'm from, this place called Navajo Mountain um, is where my father was from. But I, I was born in Arizona and spent time at Navajo Mountain. Right. Mostly grew up in Ducey, New Mexico, where, where my mother was located. But um, we were never caught by the government because of my great grandfather's doing that, that trek to Navajo M Mountain. And um, like I said, it was like one of the seven wonders of the world at, at the time um, when I grew up, this place called Rainbow Bridge. If you, if you look at it, it has a wild history. I'm curious about the layers of emotion with the art you create. You're both breaking archetypes, educating people, 
connecting to the past, connecting to the future. There's a lot of protest and activism I hear in those words, but at the same time you say your art is largely about uh, celebrating your existence. So can you say if there's an emotion that overrides what you create and what you're trying to put out there? Well, in, in that sense of, of protest or whatever is um, is interesting because it's more, um, I guess, just living and being Native American and the policies is a natural protest. You know, it's it's like it, it it's um, it's weird because it's. You have no no choice, you know. As a Native American, I mean, they they talk about Native Americans living in two worlds: the Native world and the non-Native world. But that's makes it sound too. It simplifies it too much because there's all these different weird tangents in, in it that um, makes you automatically a militant which is mm-hmm. a drag you know um so with my work um when i create the image it is a a protest kind of of how the human being is um pigeonholed into branches of races mm-hmm. you know and that's that's the the only universal thing that connects all of us together is um joy and that aspect that art can bring to somebody um that's where the neuroscience comes in involved because the artwork not only becomes a, um, a form of acceptance when someone collects it but it also becomes um a form that creates happiness with, with um, mm-hmm. the individual. And that's what makes it so prominent when it becomes in these high-end collections. And it becomes um, a humanistic protest because the artwork theoretically can become so important that society puts it behind bulletproof glass, you know, like the screen that this was vandalized a couple of days ago by um, people who are saying they're doing protests. Climate activists so, who are, who are yeah. going all over Europe in particular and, yeah, throwing tomato seeds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, from from my, um, my sources that are ex-military, they talk about how that is all a setup and that it's just um, for the world to try to pass certain um, stuff. But that's that's a whole different deal. But see how, how the artwork... Yeah, so, but that, that sees, like, that's how art can be, be, be a form of protest, too, is they're using it to as a platform for their agenda which nobody really goes down to the aspect of why that artist did that piece of work, you know, Mm -hmm. which I I think is really wild now because with this kind of um, opportunity that is happening, you get to underline what's really happening under the surface of the art and why it's being made, you know, which is going to be... a fantastic source to the people who are studying it a thousand years from now or whatever, you know, and that that's what the whole aspect of my, my work is to be able to um, mark and vandalize time with my art. Wow. Um, You know, earlier you mentioned um, energy that's created when I think you meant creating anything, but in particular marking rock or carvings. And is energy a primary motivator and a primary creation for you when you 
are making art? Is that something you think about a lot? Is the idea and the 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 movement of energy? Well, the whole the whole aspect of your heartbeat is energy, you know, um that pure pure spark of reality, of idea, the energy, electricity in your brain, you know. Mm-hmm. So it, it it's all a form of um why the work is achieved, that movement of energy. Um the creative the creative process and that creative energy that is is captured in the um in the um work um by manipulating the surface is a form of um string theory i don't i don't know if you're under into quantum mechanics or physics or whatever but there's this stuff called string theory where you, you can manipulate right you can manipulate the surface around you to create ripples in time and um theoretically the um all the different counterpoints on the surface of of the painting is different frictions that are captured in time which create energy that um mm-hmm. ma- manipulate manipulate the web of time uh-huh. so in theor- theoretical aspects that um energy is going into the future and creating ripples that theoretically come back to the creator which is the artist so there's this energy that the art is creating that goes out and it might bring success back to the artist or good luck or um in time continuum <laughs> stuff the artwork could actually be in a great collection in the future and i think somehow the artwork in the future that energy comes back to the artist right now so it it creates opportunity for the art artist to make it into that prominent collection in the future so it's kind of like a weird weird paradox you used the term hardwired in a few different directions and i wonder if one of those hardwiring notions that you're sharing is the enjoyment and pleasure that we get from art, is that, or do you think humans are hardwired universally to enjoy art? Well, psychologically they are, you know, um, that's where most of my studying comes from different medical findings and articles that I read that bring this theoretical aspect to reality. For first it's theory and then it becomes um factual when when I do come across these findings. So it's it's interesting, you know, that more more people um are understanding why there's a market for for art in general you know or um any kind of product so my my new my new aspect of creativity is making disposable art um on multi multi surfaces instead of just traditional canvas or um other other um mediums it's the 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 key to making great art is that it's archival and and that it, it'll last for the thousand to five hundred years I, I was I, I stated earlier um that's basically what drives the artwork for me is to make sure that it's archival and that it will survive and test the test time you know I'm going to explore a bunch of the concepts and locations, Navajo Mountain, uh, historic figures like Kit Carson in show notes uh, to give our listeners even more context, background, and history. Um, 
but where also, along with those show notes, where can people see and experience your art? Um, mostly Instagram. <laughs> Great. <laughs> or, that, that's or, so accessible. <laughs> my name is Koten, um, dot Dugai. Or, or a couple couple of museum shops around the country. Um, uh -huh. There's a place called the Herd Museum in Phoenix. There's also another place in Santa Fe called the Chase Trading Post at the Wheelwright Museum. But yeah, the um my my, my on my mom's side, my my great grandfather, he was a Native American sheriff of the Hickory Apache Nation, and that's um where my name comes from, Ishkoten. So he was killed in a line of duty for so some people were stealing gas from the reservation. Uh, they have they have a, it's an oil and gas um tribe. Mm. So because it's they found oil and gas on the reservation, is that why you consider it that? Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. But I guess it was it was easy to um, steal gas back in the day. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, Ducey's famous. If you look up Ducey, um, Ducey, New Mexico, it's, it's famous for it being the epicenter for. I, I don't know if I should say or if I should let you guys find out yourself, but it's supposed to be like the epicenter of um, where they control the world and all that galactic, is... galactic. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I sorry, I didn't mean to um, cut you off there in my excitement to react to it. Uh, where they control. Galactic forces are. Yeah, so we, we just talked about it. your computer froze or something. Yeah. So if you if you um if you Google it real quick, Ducey Base, you'll totally freak out. Maybe it'll give you some context to ask the next question. But I love it. Um, okay, we'll save that. And, it and is, that kind. Um, I won't edit out the the uh, the the glitch in our audio. <laughs> Maybe that's a sign, huh? <laughs> Yeah, did you did you I mean it it it's weird though because everything goes back to you talk about protests or whatever, you know, but if if these websites are right about where I'm from, Ducey, New Mexico, that it's the place where they control the world and intergalactic travel, then it's kind of kind of weird that it comes up to this um coalition of the tangents of art that I'm doing and everything, because you have to use multicolored lighting to look at my work and the work will um, become a depth of field and on the two dimensional surface, which is really wild and amazing. And most people haven't um, experienced my art to in that aspect of where because it's all it's all based on light movement, the the reasons why of color and texture. It's um capturing light movement and atmosphere instead of imagery, like a set set image. Like some of the paintings, I'll, I'll say, well, I'll I'll do I'll do recognizable image that most people like the safe stuff that will sell, you know, which is kind of like a a sellout, but it's more of trying to get that aspect of if it sells, then it'll, it'll guarantee go into a, another part of the world and create a narrative or um, mm -hmm. a space where people, the audience can talk about these issues or um, words that I put on my paintings. The youth can Google it and find out that Pink Floyd was a cool band. <laughs> and that it created a, it created a whole whole new movement in society, you know, and how how that art that art becomes a, a message of of pure freedom, you know, um, which if these websites are true about where I'm from, then that's one of the things that whoever controls the world doesn't want for human beings to be able to um, document that there is real freedom alive, which which kind of goes back to that aspect of me looking at these um, 
tools that were made in prehistoric times, you know, is that you didn't need a hammer or a knife or a factory or a store to buy the tools that were made to survive in that world, you know, and that's kind of what the artwork is. It's a modern day, modern day tool to, um, to survive and for, I guess, culture to um, underline or sneak through the, um, the wire of what society kind of like, say there's like this really cool painting and everything and next thing they, you know, um, it's, it's in this really cool collection and whoever in the future, uh, 500 years from now or 200 years from now and, and then they flip the painting over and then there's this whole aspect of maybe um, um, historical facts that are relevant at that time and shows that, um, I mean, that's kind of like the, the whole cool thing about the art is that you can send those messages into the future. Right. Um, final question. What have, what art form or work have you experienced of somebody else's of late that uh, inspired you or just sent you on a little journey or really uh, pleased you? Recent, recent people. <laughs> yeah, another, another, um, an everything from a movie to like a, an associate to a painting to a, or yeah, or a friend <laughs> or like just some artwork recently that's inspired you. Well, um, I have a really cool playlist. I think over 400 different native bands on my um, iPod. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, na native music inspires me a lot. Um, there's different genres. It, it goes um, from contemporary to traditional to just all kinds of aspects of um, indigenous music out there. And that inspires me because they're they're um some of them are using their language and it sounds so wild to be like in a rock setting or whatever or um just different aspects and and then um that's that's what really pushes me to create is the other other people who are not afraid to show creative process. That's a positive upward spiral of um creativity. Um, Ishkotin, thank you so much for taking time, sharing your thoughts, sharing your philosophies and your beliefs and everything. I feel um, really, really honored that you took time with us today. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, um, just, just remember to try not to buy stereotypes if you do collect Native art, you know, um, and then ask the artist too if... They have something that's not so stereotypical. Mm -hmm. Just to just to try to get that um, momentum going and in, in having human beings evolve, you know, yeah. that's that's what it's all about. I think is people freeing themselves from what we've been pigeonholed into thinking. Thank you. But thank you, and I, I can't wait to. Um, see what the outcome is with this recording. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. <laughs>